Okay, let's go to the sign chart. So um, two things that go into the sign chart, those critical points come from the zeros and the vertical asymptotes. And remember, we're gonna line the sign, sign chart up like um, a number line. So smallest to biggest, zeros and vertical asymptotes. We've got two of each in this example. And the smallest number is negative three, negative two, four, and then six. And then I like to include positive and negative infinity just to give me a good idea of those last two intervals there. And then I'm just gonna move left to right. So I'm gonna start on the far left side of our sign chart. I'm gonna plug in a really, really negative number and I'm going to evaluate the sign of our function. Is it gonna be positive or is it gonna be negative? So if I plug a really, really negative number in for X to our function at the very top, at its core, the numerator is x squared and the denominator is also x squared, okay? At the core of this function, we've got x squared on the top, x squared on the bottom. Highest degree in the numerator, highest degree in the denominator. So when I square a negative number, we get a positive. And again, in the new denominator, when I square a negative number, we get a positive. So on the interval, negative infinity to negative three, our function sign is positive. We're gonna be sitting above the x-axis on that interval, negative infinity to negative three. All right, so today I said we're gonna talk about shortcuts for the sign chart. <clears throat> if there is nothing special about the factors that give us zeros and vertical asymptotes, okay, nothing special about the critical values or the critical points, our sign chart is always just gonna alternate then between positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. You just need to figure out the first interval. And then the shortcut for a sign chart is then the sign is going to change on each interval. So if we started positive, then we go negative, then we go positive, then we go negative, um, then question. we go positive. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, Raina, well, go for it. Okay. Um, what would make like the numbers or the critical points special? Would it be okay, like so they're even about or that? Yeah, let me give me one second and we're, the next example we're going to do is going to be those special cases, but I'll talk about it in just a minute. Ron? Oh, okay. So would it be negative on the interval negative three to negative two? So if you plug in like neg negative one, then it's positive. Negative one is not between negative three and negative two. Right. Plug in negative 2.5. I also had a question. I was just confused a little bit because on the homework for the answers, there are like three um, positive or negative signs between each interval. Three positive or negative signs between. So like this, like that on the far left of the screen right now. Kind, it was just like a little triangle with like, like say two positives and a negative. Okay, so I was just second. I'll pull at the end, I'll pull up that answer key and I can talk through that. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. All right, so for now, let's just look at this. Okay, what makes something special then? So in this example, there are no factors being raised to any other power besides one. So what makes a factor in the numerator and the denominator special is <clears throat> the degree of that factor. So in this case, everything in the numerator and the denominator is just being raised to the power of one. In the next example, we're gonna to start to see factors being squared, okay, or cubed or to the fourth power. In those cases, that's gonna change the sign chart. So for now, all of our factors are all just being raised to the power of one, nothing special about that. Our sign chart is gonna fluctuate or like alternate between positive and negative. In the next example, so just hang on to your questions there, we're gonna see factors being raised to different powers, and then that's gonna impact our sign chart. And like I said, if you don't like the shortcut, that doesn't work for you, then continue just finding numbers in the intervals and evaluating the function for that sign. Okay, what happens though, is when I give you guys functions that have a lot of critical points, let's say there's like six zeros and vertical asymptotes total, you just have a lot of intervals to have to check. All right, but good questions, you guys. So that is the sign chart. After the sign chart, everything after the sign chart, that non-vertical asymptote, 
the intersection point and the end behavior all has to come from our function after we've performed the long division. So that's the next thing that we need to do is we need to do the long division so that we can get all the rest of the information. So in order to do the long division, I need to FOIL the numerator and the denominator. I need to multiply these factors together so that I can know what I'm dividing. Um, so x plus two times x plus three, that's just x squared plus five x plus six. And then in the denominator, x minus six times x minus four, we've got x squared minus 10 x plus 24. Right, so we're gonna use that to do the long division. Got the divisor on the outside, inside of the house, x squared plus five x plus six. And here's the deal, on homework, when you guys submit your homework next week, when you submit any work for tests or quiz with rational functions, I expect to see all this work done, okay, if you want full credit. What if we don't wanna do it the long division way? How are you gonna do it? Dividing the coefficients. And then I have a way to get the um, intersection after that too. So it so all works. I'll tell you what I need boxed, and then you can see if your work matches that. Okay, so the question is with long division, right? What do we multiply x squared by in order to get to x squared? In this case, we're just going to multiply by one. So I'm going to multiply the divisor by one. And then I need to make sure that we're subtracting everything here. When I do that, what are we left with? Well, we're left with 15x minus 18. All right, so here's what I need to see. From the long division, I'm going to re-represent this function. So we've got the factored form of our function, and then we've got what happens when we multiply the factors together. The last way that we could express this function is by taking the quotient and adding that remainder over the divisor. So if you have a different way of doing the long division of polynomials, as long as you can get here, you're good to go. Ms. Frank, I'll just show you my way after class maybe and you can see if you approve of it. Okay, so non-vertical asymptote, first thing that comes is the equation for the non-vertical asymptote, and that is always y is equal to the quotient of that long division. So in this case, y is equal to one, that horizontal line is our non-vertical asymptote. All right, next step is the intersection point. So here's what we've got to do. To find the intersection, we take the numerator of the remainder. So the top there, 15x minus 18 in this case, we set it equal to zero and we solve for x. 15x minus 18 is equal to zero. I'm gonna solve for x. So in this case, x is equal to 18 over 15, which we simplify to 6 fifths. Okay, this is an intersection point, however, which means we need to express the intersection of the non-vertical asymptote and the function as an ordered pair. So it's got to have an x and a y component. We've got the x component. We always get the x component by setting that numerator of the remainder equal to zero and solving for x. But we're going to get the y component by taking this value and plugging it in everywhere we see x into the non-vertical asymptote equation. All right, now in this case, there is no x to plug in, right? Y is just always gonna be one. So our intersection point is then the point six fifths comma one, all right? X is six fifths, Y is one. That point will be a point on our graph. It's a defined point where our function is gonna cross that non-vertical asymptote.
All right, last piece is the end behavior then. As X approaches positive and negative infinity. So we're talking only about the really far left and the really far right portions of our graph. That's what the non-vertical asymptote is gonna give us information about. We're hand graphing these rational functions. So we need to know how the function is gonna behave as X approaches a really, really small number and as X approaches a really, really big number. And so in the middle of our graph, those middle sections, if we're looking at the sign chart, those are the intervals where, that don't include positive or negative infinity. Sometimes our graph might cross that non-vertical asymptote because the non-vertical asymptote only matters when we're talking about the end behavior of our function. So I know it's complicated because up until now, graphs have never crossed asymptotes probably in your math careers. Um, and the reason is, again, the non-vertical asymptote only matters when we're talking about the end behaviors of our functions. In the middle, the non-vertical asymptote is not gonna give us any information, right? And that's why sometimes in the middle, we can see um, an intersection point or where our function is gonna cross. All right, we always approach the non-vertical asymptote though. So as X goes to positive and negative infinity, in this case, our function is gonna approach one. We just need to figure out lastly from above or below. So that comes from that whole remainder after long division here. I'm gonna take 15x minus 18 over x squared minus 10x plus 24. And the first thing I'm gonna do is plug in a really negative number for x. If I plug a really negative number in for x, we're gonna get something negative over something positive. Right? Anytime we've got x squared in the denominator like that, a really negative number squared is going to be positive. So a negative over a positive evaluates to be negative. As x approaches negative infinity, our function is going to approach that horizontal asymptote from below. And then I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to plug in a really positive number for x next. So as x gets really, really large, far right side of our graph, when I plug in a really positive number for x, right, something really big, like positive 100,000, we're going to get a positive over a positive. So we've got a positive value here, which means on the far right hand side of our graph, our function is going to be approaching that non-vertical asymptote from above it. All right, so the sign chart is gonna tell us where our function is in relation to the x-axis on all the intervals. The non-vertical asymptote and all of the information there gives us information about the end behavior of our function. Okay. All right, we're gonna put this on a graph and then we'll move on to one last example today. So any questions before I get there, um, I'm going to get rid of the work and move on to a new slide. So all this is going to get erased in a minute. How would you figure out that it's approaching from below again? Okay, so go back to the whole remainder after the long division, which is that, that whole piece I've circled in blue, that whole fraction and plug in a really negative number first. As x approaches negative infinity, 15x minus 18 over x squared minus 10x plus 24 gets really negative. Okay. And so because that value is negative, it's gonna be approaching from below. Okay. Well, what if there's no remainder? If there is no remainder, that's great, right? Then there's no intersection points. Um, I'm not going to give you an example where there's no remainder because then it's an easier function to graph. All right, here we go. Work is done. Moving on to the graph part, drop an X and a Y axis. All 
Okay, I think here, guys, I'm going to scale by a half. You don't have to. I didn't ask you to, but um, we've got some plants that are going to be really close together. So if we scale by a half, it'll just make it a little bit more spread out. All right, so I'm going to count by 0.5 on both axes. All right, if I'm going down the line, we've got no holes to graph. Our first zero is at negative two zero. And our second zero is at, and let's see, am I gonna have enough room for six? Give me one second. One, two, three, four. No, I think you guys might have enough space, but I don't. I'm sorry, I'm gonna scale by one. So I can fit everything. All right, no holes, negative two, zero, negative three, zero. They're just gonna be really, really close together. Two zeros, negative two, negative three. And then I've got a vertical asymptote at six and another one at four. Okay, asymptotes are always graphed with dotted lines. <clears throat> I have one more point, which is the y-intercept here. So 0, 1 fourth. And then the non-vertical asymptote is the horizontal line, y is equal to 1. And we have an intersection of the non-vertical asymptote and our function at 6 fifths 1. So six fifths one, it's right about there. And all those are points that our graph is gonna go through, okay? Our graph will pass through those. These aren't holes. Our function's actually defined at all those points that we plotted. And now we go to the sign chart and the end behavior piece, okay? So I've got everything graphed except for um, the sketch of our function using the sign chart and then the end behavior. So I'm going to start on the far left interval, negative infinity to negative three. So if we look at negative infinity to negative three, negative three is that first zero on the left. So it's this shaded region here. And our sign chart tells us the function is positive. So our sign chart tells us we are sitting above the x-axis. And the end behavior of our function as x approaches negative infinity the end behavior of a function says we approach the non-vertical asymptote from below. So if we're looking at this graph, where can our function exist above the x-axis, but below the non-vertical asymptote? There's only a really small space where that works. Above the x-axis, below the non-vertical asymptote is in this space right here. Okay, so that is one part of our function done. The end behavior on the far left is good to go. Now on the middle intervals, we don't need to worry about looking at the bottom. We don't need to worry about the end behavior on those middle intervals. We're gonna come back to the end behavior on the far right. So only the sign chart matters now between negative three and negative two, those two zeros. Between negative three and negative two, our function is zero or negative. So we need to dip below the x-axis here. So between those two little zeros, we're gonna come down and then we come back up to that zero, negative two. So a really small interval there. And then between negative two and four, negative two and four. So negative two is the zero, four is that vertical asymptote. Our function is positive. So we need to be above the x-axis and we need to make sure that we go through all those points, right? That y-intercept and that intersection. So positive above the x-axis through all those points there. And then we always follow asymptotes. So we're gonna go through that y-intercept through the intersection point and then we'll just be going up along that vertical asymptote 
x is equal to 4. All right, second to last interval from four to six, which is between those two vertical asymptotes. It's a really skinny part of our graph. Our function is negative. And that's what the sign chart tells us. Now, when we're between two vertical asymptotes like this and we're below the x-axis, all that we can do is graph a function or a piece of the function that looks kind of like a downward facing parabola here. Because we're sketching these parts of our function, I don't expect you to know exactly how far up that's going to come. As long as you've got a sketch of that piece of the function, you're good to go. And then the last piece, far right hand side of our sign chart, our function is positive. And because we're looking at the far right of our graph as well, we have to go back to that last um, piece about the end behavior. So on the interval six to infinity, our function is positive sitting above the x axis. And the end behavior tells us we're also above the non vertical asymptote. So where can our graph exist above the x axis above the non vertical asymptote, it can exist here. It's going to follow both of those asymptotes going up along that vertical asymptote and then it's going to get flatter as we go along the horizontal. Right, so if it's not in the information on the left hand side, then it's just a sketch of everything else. All right, somebody asked it, what happens if there's no um, remainder after long division? Okay, the simplest example I can give you is something like this. If there's no remainder, it means that something divides evenly, right? So maybe not the same, but this would be like two. And the line, this becomes a line like y is equal to two. Okay, so that would be something easier to graph. Wouldn't look quite the way that these look. So you'll always get something with the remainder. All right, I'm going to work through one more example with you guys. <clears throat> when you're done with that graph, turn to page, let's see, 14 on your student note packet. We're going to do number eight together. Okay, last one I'm going to work with you. Number eight looks like this, slightly more complicated. Got a couple more factors in here. We've got 2x squared times x minus 2 in the numerator, and then x minus 1 squared times x plus 1. So let's talk about all of this information first. So holes, any factors that we can cancel on the top and the bottom. Nothing is exactly the same on the top and the bottom. So there are no holes in this example. All right. Next, the zeros. Here's how I'm going to express this. With zeros, if you guys can solve for the zeros in your head, that's fine. Two things that could potentially make the, uh, the numerator equal to zero. Setting 2x squared equal to zero or setting x minus 2 equal to zero. So in this case, when x is equal to zero or when x is equal to positive 2, we have zeros. Remember that we express zeros as ordered pairs. Okay, so here's the deal. Before we move on to the vertical asymptotes, just want you to think about that zero, 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 okay, when x is zero. We've got x squared, which means if I want to write it like expanded, it's just two times x times x in the numerator. We've got two x's. So there are two cases where when x is zero, we have a zero on our function. Because x is being raised to an even power, in this case, x is being squared. 
something special is going to happen in our sign chart. So I just want you guys to put a star next to that zero, zero, zero. Because the factor that gave us x is equal to zero is squared in this example, that makes it special. Any time a factor is being raised to an even power is when we're going to see special critical points. Okay, so x squared gives us a zero, x is equal to zero, okay, or the point zero, zero. That's a special zero. All right, so let's take a look at the vertical asymptotes then. There are two factors, right, that can create vertical asymptotes in our graph. The line when x is equal to one and when x is equal to negative one. Okay, again, the factor x minus one is being squared. We've got two of them. If I wanna write the denominator out expanded, this is x minus one times x minus one, right? Times x plus one. So I'm also gonna put a star next to that vertical asymptote. Because the factor x minus one was being also raised to an even power, that is also a special critical point. I call these double zeros or double vertical asymptotes. Okay, double because each of them are being raised to the power of two. So anytime we've got a factor in the numerator and the denominator being raised to any even power, so it could be x to the fourth or x minus one to the fourth, Anytime we've got a zero or vertical asymptote being raised to an even power, we're going to have something special occur in the sign chart. Okay, before we get to that sign chart, let's talk about the y-intercept. So when x is zero, just plug in zero for x, we get zero for y. I knew this was going to be the y-intercept because it's also a zero. All right, let's make the sign chart. <clears throat> so negative one is the smallest, and then zero, one, and two. I like to include positive and negative infinity. And before I start filling in the signs of our functions on each of these intervals, I'm just gonna go back to the critical points that I starred, and I'm just gonna put a little star in the sign chart next to those as well. So there was a star next to zero, and there was a star next to that vertical asymptote, x is equal to one. Those came from the factors that were being squared. All right, and rules of sign charts tell us this. If there's nothing special about a zero or vertical asymptote, then the sign is gonna alternate around that zero or vertical asymptote. We'll go positive, then negative, then positive, then negative. If there is something special about one of these zeros or vertical asymptotes, meaning that those factors were being raised to an even power, that is the case where the sign is not gonna change around that zero or vertical asymptote. So let's see what happens in the sign chart. We're gonna find the value of our function, the sign of our function, on the first interval, negative infinity to negative one. You always have to do that. There's no getting around that. So plug in a really, really negative number to our function, okay? At its core, this function is x cubed over x cubed. We've got a cube over a cube. Highest degree of the numerator is x cubed. Highest degree of the denominator is three, okay? So x cubed over x cubed. If I cube a really negative number, I get a negative value. So what happens is we end up with a negative over a negative. First interval here then is actually positive, right? When I take a negative divided by a negative, we get something positive. Okay, negative one was not a special vertical asymptote. We didn't have a star next to it, which means with the shortcuts of sign charts, the sign will change. If it's positive on the left, it's gonna be negative on the right.
But then we get to zero. And that was a special zero. We put a star next to it because the factor that gave us zero was being squared, being raised to an even power. Anytime we've got those special cases, the sign won't change. So the sign to the left of zero is negative, which means the sign to the right of zero is also going to be negative. The sign does not change around zeros or vertical asymptotes that were being raised to even powers. So same thing with number one or with one in our um, sign chart. We have a double vertical asymptote here. The sign is not going to change around one as well. But there was nothing special about two. So with two, if the sign is negative on the left, then we're going to change on the right. Okay, just a shortcut there. Again, if you don't like it, then stick to plugging in numbers. Right, between negative one and zero, plug in negative 0.5 and see what the sign is. Between zero and one, plug in 0.5 and see what the sign is. It's just an optional shortcut there. Okay, last piece of information. Everything under the sign chart requires us to do the long division here. So I've got to uh, multiply everything out in the top and the bottom so that I can do the division. So I've got to distribute this 2x squared to both of these terms. We're going to get 2x cubed minus 4x squared on the top. And then I'm going to FOIL this x minus 1 squared first. I'm going to deal with that. And then I will do the multiplication by x plus 1. So this is going to become x squared minus 2x plus 1 times x plus 1. All right, I'm going to distribute, right, or FOIL. If you like to use the box method to multiply polynomials, it's fine, whatever you like. That's going to be x cubed minus 2x squared plus x plus x squared minus 2x plus 1. Okay, after we multiply everything together, this is what my function looks like. Now I've got to use that in order to do the division. So um, we've got x cubed minus x squared minus x plus one on the outside. On the inside, we've got two x cubed minus four x squared. Okay, here's the deal, you guys. I would take your time on the multiplication part because if you make a mistake there, it's going to be really hard to make sure you're getting the right values after that. So just be really careful. I showed a lot of extra steps there. I didn't want to do everything in my head because I didn't want to miss a sign or a particular value. So just spend time there to make sure you're not losing points later on when you're getting the non-vertical asymptote, all of the end behavior, which then transfers to the graph. Okay, question here is what do I multiply x cubed by in order to get to 2x cubed? And the answer is 2. I'm going to multiply the divisor by 2 and then subtract everything. So this is 2x cubed minus 2x squared minus 2x plus 2. We're subtracting everything here. All right, once I do that subtraction, I can write the final um, new form of our function. So our new form of our function is the quotient 2 plus this remainder here over the divisor. All right, get there. Show me that. All right, non-vertical asymptote, y is equal to the quotient, which is just two in this case, so we still have a horizontal non-vertical asymptote. All 
All right, what's next and most complicated is the intersection point. So you guys are gonna stop me if you've got any questions, but I'm gonna take the numerator of this whole remainder. I'm gonna set it equal to zero and we're gonna solve for X. Now here's the deal. I'm gonna factor a negative two out of everything. And then I'm gonna take this piece and I'm gonna factor it, right? X squared minus X plus one. Let's factor that. All right, slight problem though. This is getting a little running out of room. Okay, when I try to factor this, right? What numbers multiply to one and add to negative one? There's nothing here that works for that, right? I can't factor this, x squared minus x plus one. So that doesn't mean that we're done. If we can't factor a quadratic, the only other option to solve for x with a quadratic is to use the quadratic formula. So I've got to use the quadratic formula here to solve for x. So x is equal to opposite b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Quadratic formula to solve for x. What happens is we see this, 1 plus or minus the square root of negative 3 over 2. We've got a problem. Can't take the square root of a negative number. So this whole piece can never actually equal zero. Right, we've got imaginary roots there. Anytime we're taking the square root of a negative number, we can't actually solve for x. I don't expect you guys to put imaginary answers into your solutions here. So there is no intersection point. Not because there wasn't an x to solve for in the remainder, but because when we got down to it, right, that quadratic doesn't have any roots. It doesn't touch the x-axis. No intersection points. Okay, last piece is the end behavior. I'm gonna do this in the upper right-hand corner. I'm sorry that I'm running out of room here. As X approaches negative infinity and positive infinity, where is our function going? Well, our function is always going to approach the non-vertical asymptote. So in this case, we're approaching two. Whether it's from above or below is all that's left to figure out. Okay, so last piece. I'm gonna take this entire remainder here. Everything I'm circling in red. I'm gonna plug in a really positive and a really negative number to see where we're approaching our non-vertical asymptote. So let's start with negative. Plug in a really, really negative number for x. Okay, at its core, this is negative x squared over x cubed. So a negative number squared is positive, but we still have that coefficient, which is negative. So we end up with a negative over a negative because any negative number cubed is also negative. So a negative over negative is actually positive. We're actually gonna be approaching the non-vertical asymptote from above as X goes to negative infinity. And then when we plug in a really positive number for x into that whole remainder, something really positive, well, any positive number squared is positive, but then we have that negative on the outside, which makes it negative. And then any positive number cubed is positive. So in this case, as x approaches positive infinity, we're actually gonna be approaching our non-vertical asymptote from below. Okay, before I actually give you guys the answer to the graph, go ahead and try it on your own first. So I'm gonna pause my screen. I'll do the graph, but I'll put the answer up in a couple of minutes. Just make a note here. I did ask you guys to scale by one half on this one. 
So count by 0.5 along the x-axis, everything should fit like that. It just makes the graph a little bit more spread out. But give the graph a try before you see my answer. And then if you finish early, just get started on the rest of the homework before I go through the solution. Okay, graph is on the board or on the whatever Zoom window. Um, general sketches there. The only points that we really have to make sure we're accurate are that zero, zero, and the other zero. Wait, so where's the y intercept? The y intercept is the, the origin point, zero, zero. But, oh, never mind, I did the y intercept wrong. Oops. Okay. Okay, so one last thing I want to I want you guys to look at graphically. Remember, in that sign chart, if we were looking at the um, the shortcuts for the sign chart, those double zeros and those double asymptotes. What does that actually mean on the graph? Okay, well on the sign chart we didn't change signs around zero and around one, right? In our sign chart, everything stayed negative around those two values. On a graph, if we're looking at something graphically, what that means is at that zero, 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 we don't actually cross the x-axis. We come up, we touch it, but then we go back down. The sign doesn't change. Our function doesn't cross the x-axis there. Now, around that vertical asymptote, x is equal to one, we also had a special case where the sign doesn't change. Now, sign not changing around an asymptote means that on both the left and the right side of the asymptote, our function will approach the same value. So in this case, our function is going down to negative infinity um, on both the left and the right side of our asymptote. And that comes from that special case where we have that power in the denominator being raised to an even power, or the factor in the denominator being raised to an even power. Okay, so graphically, that's what it looks like when I say we're not changing sign. In most cases, right, the regular cases where nothing is special, 
we have one side of the asymptote going to positive infinity, the other side going to negative infinity. 